Hi everyone, this is Meenakshi Ramesh from TappyWayToHealing.com. Today we continue with the April Autism Awareness Series as we honor neurodiversity. And today I have a good friend once again uh, for my channel. Her name is Divya Ravi and she is going to be talking about um, neurodiversity and affirming approach um, through ABA. So that's going to be today's topic. Before we have a conversation, I would like to read Divya's bio. Divya Ravi has a master's in computer engineering, a board certified. She's also a board certified behavioral ana behavior analyst and a certified yoga teacher. Divya absolutely loves cooking and tries out new foods. She lives in the Bay Area with her husband and her 15 year old son who is on the autism spectrum. Divya has worked um, in school settings uh, through in, in K to 12 schools in the past and now she is focusing more um, on working with parents and children on their academic skills and emotional self-regulation and co-regulation skills. Divya uh, brings her training in yoga and she's also in the process of getting certified as a mind-body coach. So she brings all these skills and uses, brings an eclectic approach to teaching, um, uh, teaching um, ABA, applying the principles of the ABA while honoring neurodiversity and um, incorporating an affirming approach to everyday life that parents and children, um, everyday life skills and challenges that parents and children face on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's a uh, that's, uh, short intro about Divya and I would like to, I would like Divya to begin um, the conversation by uh, defining and talking a little bit about ABA, what is ABA and what is neurodiversity. Over to Divya. Thanks Radha for having me and all the videos you have done in this series so far have been amazing and thanks for having me. So starting with what is ABA? ABA is Applied Behavior Analysis. So we just like behavior analysis is a science of um, studying behavior and learning and studying how the environment around us affects the behavior and learning. And applied behavior analysis is applying these concepts that we learn and in its simplistic term, just like how to increase a behavior by modifying the environment around us or how to decrease a behavior by uh, you know, making it conducive. So that, that is what applied behavior analysis is. And uh, the neurodiversity affirming approach is like, um, historically, when the autistic adults talk, it was like, and uh, applied behavior analysis is actually applicable to all human problems and uh, challenges. And uh, we, uh, right now it is very popular and uh, it, it is uh, predominantly applied to the autistic population. And from the historically, as like kids become adults and when they have gone through this whole practice, an overwhelmingly large amount of them have actually expressed that it has been pretty traumatic to them. So as a, a practitioner, I think it's my responsibility to hear the autistic voices because that is the population we are trying to serve and actually take that into account. And so neurodiversity uh, is in general is like just uh, right now the, the model we mo in most popular is that it's called the medical model where we see any difference uh, is, a, is a deficit or as a problem to be fixed. So neurodiversity affirming and neurodiversity is like all these differences are part of nature. It's not that one is better, being neurotypical is better than and being you know, neurodiverse. So that is not the case. Everything is a variation that occurs in this world. Mm -hmm. And it's not that being the neurotypical is the golden standard. And we have to cater all our goals to make the kids look more like neurotypical or function more neurotypical. So neurodiversity affirming approaches actually uh, rejects that, the medical model, and then say all of us function, have our own differences in learning, the way we process our environment. And all of this is valid. We don't have to fix anything or change anything. So our goal is to, so this is how the kid processes the environment. 
how can we best change or adapt the environment to help the learning better for them? So the, instead of saying for uh, the eye contact is a very uh, like a common yeah, yeah. goal that is being worked. So, and then again, right. autistic adults have expressed that it is extremely uncomfortable for them to do that. And with my own son, I have observed that if you, if you ask him to, you know, give a good eye contact, he cannot learn anything because all his energy is focused on that. And so like in my, uh, when I email the teachers, the first email I send them, I send them is do not, you know, like emphasize eye contact, just teach. He can look like when he was like younger, like I would say like a four or five year old in the circle time, they would say like, don't ask him to look at you. You just, he can look wherever and then you teach and then you ask him, you would answer. If you actually, you know, keep insisting on the eye contact, that is all he can do. He's not going to learn. And he, your goal is to teach him. And again, another example would be the whole body listening that we say like, I, hands are quiet, body is still, eyes are looking so Again, the autistic adults have said this has been like pure torture for them because they have to move their body. That's how their sensory systems work. And then so like uh, a neurodiversity affirming approach would be to let the kid move around, you know, like, uh, and then provide your instruction. And then when they, when they have to, like, if they have to point something or something, just like let them come briefly point to the point and then again, let them move around. And if okay. moving around, standing up and moving around is like kind of not very practical, let them actually just rock their bodies. Don't stop them from rocking their bodies. And so this is why like we say neurotypical approach. I can focus better when I'm not moving. That doesn't mean my client can focus better when they are not moving. So that is like, we are not going to take our neurotypical standards and put them, put them on them and say, so our goal is to teach them, learn, and to live in this world. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it's we are like the neurotypicals are the neuro majority. So we have kind of made the rules to satisfy mm -hmm. our, you know, like that is how it is. So we have, they have to live in this world. So we have to teach them those skills. But how can we do it in a way that they don't feel I am wrong? The way mm -hmm. I exist is wrong. So when I, even when I start the therapy with the clients or like when I, start any section I just tell them these are the goals so this is like not not because what you're doing especially it comes to the social skills we have this thing like these are the things that is like back and forth conversation and but a lot of aut uh, autistic kids and adults like to talk about a topic for a longer time and then they not they don't they are not very comfortable with our back and forth so if I'm going to teach that skill to the my client I'll tell them it's not because what you do is wrong but sometimes in an interview or when you're communicating, if you want your ideas to get through to the other person, you have to modify it a little bit to, so that you convey what you need. But we also tell the neurotypical interviewer or whoever it is to we also explain the autistic uh, preferences and communication preferences to them so that they know that so it's not it's like a two-way road we teach them yeah. we also learn so that we meet in the middle we don't make them do all the work That's so that right. is one of the, the core principles of yeah. neurodiversity affirming approach and just let the kids like just validate their experiences right. their way of processing their way of communication mm -hmm. so that is my that's beautifully, you beautifully said, uh, Divya, you know, as you were talking, um, the, the two, two phrases that came to my mind was one is it's a paradigm shift from how therapy was, uh, you know, maybe two decades back because my son is 22 years old. It's a paradigm shift. And also from what you're talking, explaining, I think it's more of um, ABA uh, when you have, a, uh, have an affirming approach it is uh, more of a client-centered approach, right? You're always, the client is the focus, not what the client thinks and feels is so important and what the therapist or the practitioner, what you feel and think is, is not, the, not the idea there. So um, that's, that's just so awesome. And I love, and I love, the, love your introduction. Thank you, Mina. So I, I, I'm sorry to talk over you. I want to add yeah. one more. So one of the component of ABA is called social validity. We means like what is important. 
we do that but again most of the time this what is important has been applied to what is hap- important to the parents of the autistic mm. kids and now mm. we are trying to change that to what is mm. important to the our clients our paying clients might be the parents but our mm. actual clients are the children so okay. when i say okay. for one example would be to when they when, when the mom says i want my kid to join uh, like go to this birthday party because he is like you know he is very aversive to the birthday song being sung and he runs away from it and then I, and we ask the question is it important to you or is it important to the kid you think the kid is missing out or uh, but is that like if that is so aversive are we going to spend our time and uh, and the kids time on making them you know okay with the desensitizing them to the birthday music is it something that the kid would want to put them towards that aversive sound if they are affecting them or is it something the parents want for the child right so like that is also as you said that paradigm shift is a great word to you so do we have to or the goals like do you you want the kid to have a eye contact but how important is it for the kid to actually get the information that is what our goal is right so yeah. asking these questions and formulating the goals yeah right and i'm so glad you you talked about eye contact and you know body regulation because those are two things my son we still love, you know to help him to regulate himself and just to by you know by because by practice i'm so used to tell him so that, can you look at me <laughs> i still say that and now i, I realize that it's i mean over the years i've come to understand like as you said as you said reading from many people adults who are on the spectrum they say that it's very it's 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 also very scary for many they say that it's uh, you know it, it's very traumatic for them if you just keep telling them to look at me look at me so yeah and same with the regulation my son sometimes it is calm body calm body and he is he himself is trying to regulate but you know you can see that he also wants to but you know he needs it he needs that to that movement to regulate himself so uh, thank you divya um so moving on to um i know you be you touched touched upon eye contact um, could you talk a little bit about positive reinforcement because that's something you know um um, um a, a something that's used uh, one of the principles of aba so if you can talk a little bit about positive reinforcement prompting and um, nonverbal communication how these things are incorporated in the affirming approach you know so you don't have to go in detail but just you know give if you can give some examples or like i don't know yeah sure like uh, the yeah. principle of positive reinforcement is like universal so mm-hmm. we if we you know for us to do some behavior over and over uh, what right after follows the behavior if it is going to be like a praise or like if you are after working if you are getting your salary at the end or else if you keep working and you never get the salary at the end you shall stop working so for the behavior to go on so we do need the positive reinforcement really helps the behavior occur but instead of the positive reinforcement has kind of turned into but yeah that's so you know like that the kind of praise which seems very shallow and our clients do yeah. sense that yeah. right yeah. instead of that it's like if it is more just a smile or like whatever yeah. is valuable to the instead of just having this cookie cutter approach about what yeah, is sure. like if it if the kid wants a break if that is the thing yeah. or sometimes not saying it. for my own son making a big deal out of anything is like very aversive yeah. to him so actually yeah. not saying anything would make him do it more than yeah. like doing yeah. and you know what we think as positive reinforcement or good just observing it and yeah. what they really find it reinforcing instead of oh you should like presents but some yeah. of the kids like don't like a surprise would be like you know they you, you think something would make them happy overwhelming. and then like this but it might be yeah, sensorily very overwhelming for them and actually yeah. Yeah. uh the positive reinforcement or whatever we do just tailoring to what the client actually needs and reinforces and finds it valuable yeah. that is the uh like the goal of the positive reinforcement still is very much a component of the neurodiversity terming practice mm-hmm. but how does it look like instead of just saying like in, because some of the my clients back then used to say if i even before i say good job they would say good job because they know mm-hmm. if you do this this is what follows then it is not really serving as a positive reinforcement anymore so just thinking about what 
if they have done something and you want it to occur over and over, what is some genuine uh, reinforcement mm-hmm. that they would like and actually giving it, right. just being thoughtful about these things would be right. it's the best positive reinforcement. Right. And and regarding even greetings, you know, I, I, I talked about um, the reason I, I, um, I wanted you to talk about prompting and prompt fading is like, you know, greetings, saying hi or, you know, saying bye. Um, over the years, what happens is, um, as you rightly said, they are maybe they are their friend is in the house their friend a friend's family walked into the house and you know we just prompting the child to you know welcome them probably they're they're acknowledging their presence but then not saying it so um i i would really like some advice tip on on that for myself for my son because you know that's something we still do it so should we say that okay can you say hi to them or should we just be quiet like so, I really don't know. <laughs> it is like kind of like uh, it is. This is not the best practice or some. So it is an approach yeah. that I. So it's more like an opinion than a fact. What I say. Yeah. So what I do with my son is like okay, they are going to come, and then I just yeah. when I say, and then first I used to say like say hi and like just like as you yeah. said. Nowadays I uh, tell I, I just like remind him that he's there coming, and sometimes he walks away, and then I yeah. actually take the instead of making him do it something, I just explain it to them that you know sometimes just seeing you, he is so happy, but he's yeah. overwhelmed by, by the emotions, and he needs a second away to process, and he will come back. So yeah. like instead of our biggest fear is what others will think of our kids because right, we're right. so you know we just want everyone to understand them and how amazing right. they are and right. when uh, they don't we are like oh we are just scared of the judgment mm-hmm. so i actually tell them and now uh, like you know uh, i just tell them okay so this is why just explaining the uh, behavior to them rather than asking him to do something so that is us taking that step so okay. and then I also tell them, okay, uh, if if it is like really well known friends, they have, know everything. And for example, if I met someone and they're coming for the first time, I just text them saying, I know expect some uh, neurodiverse behavior. So which would oh, be okay. if they are giving a gift, he would say no. So I usually tell them. So if you are actually if you really want, he loves that Roblox gift card. Mm-hmm. But if he gives it, if they give it to him. He just gets so warmed in and he will say no and walk away. Instead of telling him that's being disrespectful, come here, take it, mm-hmm. say thanks. I actually tell them he actually loves it. Mm-hmm. If you give it, he might say this, but it's just because he's overwhelmed by his emotions. Mm-hmm. So it's better than, than give it to him, give it to me. And after you have left, I will give it to him. And he actually sends thank you a message. Again, I don't ask him to, but he says, mm-hmm. can I send thank you to them? That's mm-hmm. a text. So when yeah, in the real yeah. moment, so I take that uh, effort to explain yeah. to them. Some of them don't understand and they are not my friends anymore. So, right, so I right. just like kind of right. curate our circle mm-hmm. so that he doesn't have to perform anything mm-hmm. for anyone. Right. And, uh, and uh, this is, it is, and also I have to say that I'm not perfect all the time. The old mm-hmm. behaviors creep up all right. the time. And right, then you right. apologize to him mm-hmm. saying, like, I, Amma should not have done this. I should have done this, but you know, I, I'm still learning and I just go and apologize to him if I'm not doing the right one, but I later realize. So. Right, right. Beautifully said, Divya. And this is something, you know, that's why I, I just, I, I, I'm so excited to learn about this topic. I'm sure it's, there is so much to learn uh, on just this topic with, with your training and experience. Um, um, so let me just pause for a minute. So let's just move on to what are the new directions in the field of ABA with this, uh, you know, affirming approach. Uh, so another major one, other than the affirming approach is, again, affirming approach, a lot of, we are, as a field, we are still learning. It's like a process. And then other bigger one is the acceptance and commitment training. So there are behaviors called overt behaviors. They are the observable behaviors mm-hmm. and they are covert behaviors where like the thinking that you cannot really see. So we have predominantly focused on overt behaviors mm-hmm. so far. And this is like, when I say latest, the research has been from 80s, mm-hmm. but now it has moved from the labs to the actual mm-hmm. practice, like mm-hmm. applied. So acceptance and commitment training is the one that works a lot on the cognitive flexibility is the main goal of it. And this is not just for the kids on the spectrum. It's for like, it's, it's a widely, uh, you know, it's called acceptance commitment therapy when it's uh, by the therapist for all, all our 
uh, you know, adults as well, and like you know, neurotypicals as well. And that pa- a branch of it, uh, for a, a behavior analysis, it's called acceptance and commitment training, mm-hmm. and that is more on like thoughts and the kids, uh, like the it works on the anxiety, and mm-hmm. you know, how can we increase our fl- flexible uh, thinking mm-hmm. by mm-hmm. just like letting the if there is a problem and not really help you know making it go away but we do you know like accept that and then how to be like in the present moment being mindful so words like mindfulness were not a part of the aba vocabulary so far mm-hmm. but this acceptance mm-hmm. and commitment training is like mm-hmm. it, it brings into things like our kids need to learn that like being present mm-hmm. moment aware it's not just all about like breathing so right now mm-hmm. it, it's like if you're anxious take five breaths it's pretty much the a go to thing but like not okay. there are so many other things that works on this so you know taking action deciding okay. what your values are so kid sitting with the kid so kid uh, sitting with the kids and okay these are your values you want to do you want mm-hmm. to go to college so for this mm-hmm. college what we want to do you have to take committed action what would that be you are going to study this many hours so how can we like as a aba practitioner help you attain this goal the value can just be i want to watch video game without my mom bothering me so it need not be this high and mighty values but yeah. this, so these are the values that you want and then what action right. committed action can you take so when we keep mm-hmm. talking about the intrinsic motivation right with the positive mm-hmm. reinforcement a lot of time right. it is like extrinsic motivation and right. when the kids are like one that is one of the most common things i hear mm-hmm. from the parents like my kid mm-hmm. is not motivated so mm-hmm. these kinds of working with the values the one thing is it does require a little bit of more ve- verbal mm-hmm. repertoire it need not be speaking it's not mm-hmm. speech verbal is not speech it's communication so even mm-hmm. if uh, it requires a little like a slightly uh, uh, more uh, the skill set with the verbal behavior mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. if the kids are at that stage then we can definitely sit with them they mm-hmm. talk about their values the committed action and kind of getting a buy in mm-hmm. why should we do all this so that you can you know attain your values in life so mm-hmm. that is like a, and then uh, again for dealing with anxiety and another some of them have intrusive thoughts so how do That's we right. actually deal with it so as like a writing the same it, it has the aba programs it has it is slightly uh like more sophisticated uh, uh, approach for uh, right. dealing with like a more challenging uh, thoughts which are uh, it thoughts rather than actions and behavior and we are recognizing more and more all this like the behaviors and the function and people what we call the attention seeking behavior yes. so we you know those are a very negative connotation for our, what our kids are doing all yes. this is driven by something happening inside Okay. and this is just an expression and without call, you know fixing the root cause if you mm-hmm. keep at calling them as like escape behavior when the kid might not have the prerequisite skills to do it mm-hmm. it like uh, it's like kind of villainizing everything that they do right okay. so instead yeah. of that actually trying to understand what's happening and mm-hmm. again it's like still a very emerging uh, you know like application and but is that is one more direction that we are taking and trying to go beyond the four functions mm-hmm. calling it escape and attention seeking and actually go into more why do they actually they might not have had food and they might be yeah. angry because of that right, you know right, it's right. like an aggression might be because but we have to right, consider right. those setting events as well instead of mm-hmm. just what happens before and after expanding right. it mm-hmm. and right. actually taking into account that human responses so right and you know i, I that's again you know very uh, val- well validated and beautifully shared with you uh, divya i this is something as a parent uh, over the years i've learned with my son the moment we i sit with him and i when he's going through a difficult time i really i understand what you're going through i get i get it you know that's all i that's all sometimes they need to hear just you know i i understand your pain i understand where you're coming from or or however you want to word it the idea so i think that 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 is shifted that can be a huge shift for many children 
children, not children to adults for anybody. I think we all need to hear that also sometimes, right? When we are in a difficult situation, you know, someone, a friend or, a, you know, a loved one coming and telling us that, you know, I get what you're saying. I understand. That's all they, that's all they need to hear. We don't have to go more than that. So just sharing my um, uh, perspective as well. Um, so um, again, I, I, I want to focus, I want you to talk about two, two things. One is the new directions in the field of ABA. And before the recording, you, you did um, speak a little bit about um, emotional regulation uh, and co-regulation. Mainly, I feel um, if you can share some tips for parents, because I truly believe that, you know, it, in self-care, when we take good care of ourselves, we can be more present for our child. So if you can talk a little bit on both, both those things, then it will be great. Yeah. Sure. So uh, as you said, it's like we emotional regulation for our, for the parents is like one of the most important thing for kids to be happy and, you know, thriving. So the em emotional regulation for the parents, it looks like uh, uh, just first is um, taking care of yourself. And I think like the movement and, uh, you know, like movement is a non-negotiable part of our movement is like uh, as therapy right now. So it's, uh, just going for a walk or whatever, you know, you can do to take care of yourself. That would be the, the first uh, uh, recommendation I would give. Mm -hmm. And then uh, even for the kids as well, when you're going, going for walks together and like doing small, even if it's like a two minute activity or like mm -hmm. you, since I'm a yoga teacher, I, mm -hmm. uh, I uh, teach a lot of uh, your like uh, partner yoga is a mm -hmm. great way to regulate. When I say co-regulation, both of them like sitting with their feet together and then just like, again, if the kid is interested in it again if the kid is not interested and you're going to like force them to do none of this work so whatever if the kid most of our kids the thing is like with my experience of work very very few kids uh i would say are aversive to movement once it's like presented not with like come here do this kind of thing like more like an open invitation mm -hmm. movement is something our kids naturally like mm -hmm. so even if it's like jumping on the trampoline anything mm -hmm that uh, helps the, uh, you know, like uh, reg uh, help them regulate. That is one of the uh, most important component of the uh, regulation. And uh, also about uh, with parents being aware of our feelings. And if you are like in a hurry and uh, if, you are, if you have only five minutes and then not asking the kids to do something for example, if you are working on putting on the socks independently and like, and you have only five minutes, you have, you have to kind of realize uh, we are not in the mental space to be like calm and patient and it, we can only go downhill from there and actually having that awareness and like, you know, uh, let's, okay, right now I am not in a calm state of mind to work through with my child. So instead of being it being such a, emotionally charged one for the kid and you and everyone ending up feeling bad just like being a, a play thinking about the time you have and the emotional capacity you have already had a bad day it's okay not to you know work with your kid for one hour that day just giving you being compassionate self-compassion is another big thing as you you are i know you are big into it as well so it is i think like we want to you know do the best with our kid okay the whole day I haven't worked and already at 8 p.m i am it has happened to me as yeah. well it more than me so I'm, it's 8 p.m i have not done anything with him because i had a busy day and he is he is like already sleepy and then i'm like asking okay. him to do something and like you know it's okay if we don't uh, you know right, meet right. our uh, our own goals every day. So like really being aware of our own feelings and like, and then having the compassion and we have the whole life to work, you know, with our kids. Right, right. Just yeah. to and, them in. Have, and then it's so confusing for them, our kid thinks, well, I mean, I'm okay. Why is mom acting up all of a sudden? Exactly, so because I had already had a bad day and then I'm like, I have zero patience and you know, just being aware is my number one thing is at first is like the movement and then like being aware of my own you know the limits 
I am not the super woman though. The whole, everyone says autism, super mom. I actually <laughs> don't like the term at all. <laughs> all. I'm not super mom. I don't yeah. want to be. I'm just yeah. like human yeah. and I have my own limits and I don't yeah. have to keep pushing through everything, yeah. be on a firefighting mode all the time. We have yeah. to live our life. Yeah. And then in that, like, you know, just giving compassion to myself and then yeah. just uh, take uh, being aware of my feelings and it's okay to let go of things it's okay to if you know to just maintain that and uh, everyone's mental well-being putting that as the first and that as the focus it would be my uh, I think uh, very important uh, recommendation for then just to be aware and no urgency when, when also the neurodiversity affirming approach helps you be calm it's like it's not you're always trying to fix something Oh my God, you go to bed thinking I have hundred things that I have to work on because I have to make this kid like this, mm-hmm. you know, with that actually when you are calm, it, it re- I, I, we all know how the kids pick up on our Energies, uh, you know, yeah. the emotions. Yes. And so like just on your mindset level, the neurodiversity affirming and your body level, just taking good care mm-hmm. and then not having any urgency as we work, we want our kids to thrive. Mm-hmm. We want our, mm-hmm. we have to work on a lot of things but uh, not from again a deficit point of view rather than what can i help to do my kids uh, to thrive in this world and he is she is okay as they are so they don't have to fix anything so that has given me so much peace Mm. and have given my son as well like i'm not always or else i'll be like always trying to note down okay this he's not doing this he's not doing that you have to do this right that's a very stressful environment for a kid to grow up in right so true true. yeah totally agree with you and um, from from what you're from whatever you've shared so far I feel there is a lot of hope I I feel very hopeful you know that um, um, having this approach this affirming approach um, towards neurodiversity using the principles of ABA. ABA is something, you know, I think all of us need. I remember years ago, my son's therapist, one of the therapists used to come home, like sometimes when the in the therapy room, if things are scattered, you know, so at that time my son was very young. So he'd say, he'd tell me, I think you need some ABA. He'll come and clean up the room first before he sets the table, you know. So I, I feel we all are human and so are, so are children. So are our children. And I think... Uh, this uh, approach gives uh, the parents and the kids a lot of autonomy, I feel, in the first place and um, gives a lot of hope that, you know, things can shift. And even if it doesn't, it's OK. It's OK, if, you know, to be uh, to allow our children, uh, the individuals on the spectrum to be who they are. Um, so do you want to add anything else um, uh, before we wrap up, uh, Divya? I think anything you can be it beautifully. And yeah. uh, some of the principles like I shared here is like mm-hmm. about the ACT and ABA is actual pure ABA. And some of them is mismatched a little bit with by me, like the mind body certification and the yoga. Yeah. So I, uh, yeah, so I just use all these approaches. So this is like not just the ABA alone, but mm-hmm. from other streams as well. And I kind of combine it to bring it. Awesome, awesome. So just, uh, just you can share the audience with the audience uh, how if they want to contact you, um, uh, you know the way how how can they reach out to you if they want if they want a consultation or they need help with their children. Sure, they can reach out to me with uh, my email. So it's ravi r a v i dot divya d h i v y a at gmail dot com. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, Divya. Thank you so much for taking this time and sharing your wisdom, insights and knowledge. I learned, I I feel I learned only a little bit. So if you uh, teach any workshops, you know, on this topic, uh, please let us know, share in the groups and, uh, um, you know, we would love to learn more from you because I obviously can see that there is this is like a vast field and uh, there is so much to learn and having an integrative approach to anything especially with our, with our children there is no one size fits all an integrative approach is um, is is always going to be successful and fruitful in terms of getting results yeah. thanks again divya thank you so much for your work all that you do including your like the tapping workshops and like just like the bhajan classes mm-hmm. and just being this calming presence in our world thank you so much thank you divya thank you so much <laughs>
fixed a limit and stop recording and then I'll